everybody has it going forest here with another installment of my complete analysis of 389 bach chorales we're looking at puer natus in bethlehem today it's an interesting chorale it's a short chorale um, definitely continuing with the idea of modality as you see that we're pretty clearly in the key of like c a minor you know we have no we have no accidentals but we see a lot of f sharps thrown into the mix so the piece has a very a Dorian feel to it with that major sixth and it did complicate the analysis a little bit but I tried to stay consistent with it um, in the sense that I'm trying to continue with my tonal lens looking at Bach even though this is one of Bach's earlier chorales and it's going to be more on the modal side of things or if modality were to emerge from the music it would be in his earlier work that being said, um, we should just get right into it, just to relish the fact that we have a short one to look at today. Uh, so we start pretty clearly in the key of, well actually, we don't really start clearly. We start on an A minor triad, which would tempt us to think that we were in the key of A minor. But I think because we're in A minor for so brief of a time, I think we actually start off in the key of C major, and we start on a six chord. So we have an A minor triad. The bass leaps up an octave, then we have a passing seventh on the bass, followed by a D major triad. So I would be tempted in A minor to call this a four, but in the key of C major, this is five, six of five, as D major is the dominant of G major, which it goes to next. So five, six of five to five. We then leap down to D in the bass. That's a chord tone, so we don't need to analyze it. And then it turns into a G7 over F, which is five, four, two. So we don't need to reanalyze with a Roman numeral, just changed the uh, figured base. Then we have E, C, G, C. That is a C major triad in first inversion, which turns into a 1, 5, 3 on this beat before going to F, C, F, A. That's an F major triad or a four chord. And then we cadence on one. So we go 1, 4, 1. Uh, this is a very textbook plagal cadence as four going to one doesn't have the same dominant feel as five to one does but it's common in church music especially in hymnal music like this so it's being used in a context that makes sense for it and we're just going to keep going the next cadence that we're looking at is in the key of c major again um, it's perfect authentic this time however as we see five here which is a g d g b a, a g major triad going to one. So five to one, four to one. Again, with sort of like grammatical structure and music, the way that the cadences line up have a an impact on how the phrases sound in conjunction with one another. If you proceed a perfect authentic cadence with another cadence, it'll make that perfect authentic cadence either sound like its own sentence or the tail end of a longer complex sentence. And in this case, because the perfect, ca uh, sorry, the plagal cadence is preceding the perfect authentic cadence. This feels like a complex sentence rather than two separate ideas. So we go to another C chord here. The bass leaps up an octave, and then we go to B, G sharp, D. That is, uh, also we have the E carried over in the tenor. I was almost tempted to call that seven, uh, six, four of five or six, but this is actually five, for three of six. This is an E7 triad over B, which is the fifth of the chord. And you would expect that to go to six right there. And then we have F sharp, D, A, C. That's five, six, five of five. That goes to five. That goes to one. D major, all five of five is, is a substitution for two. Two in the key of C major is D minor. Five of five is major. So really, it's just one as a substitute for an uh, for the other. They both function in similar ways. Also, in um, in the in a Dorian where you have the F sharp, you can invert the you you can have the F sharp in the bass, and uh, it's it's interesting how it works out that way. Or rather, no, it has nothing to do with the F sharp in the bass. It has to do with the fact that a four chord turns from minor to major because the raised sixth while still maintaining that natural uh, seventh, which is interesting. All right, so now we are going forward. We go from six, or sorry, a one chord to a six chord, 
A, E, A, C. It's just an A minor triad. Then we have F sharp, D, A, C. That's another five, six, five of five. A D7 chord over F sharp. And then, then this turns into seven, five, three. As all that happens is that we get some we, we get some voices going down a third. We get the alto and the bass both going down a, a diatonic third. And that eventually goes to five, which is a G major triad. G D G B. Then we have E E G B, that is a three chord. And remember three and one are kind of interchangeable because they are a third apart, therefore they share two tones. And the tone that they don't share is a seventh apart. In this case, C, E, G versus E, G, B. So they are interchangeable for all intents and purposes. Um, I'd say, or I say all intents and purposes, most intents and purposes. The only purpose that I could think of where it wouldn't really be a, a, um, a substitution that would make a lot of sense would be at a cadence. Then we have C sharp, E, G, A. That sounds like a uh, 5-6-5, five, five, because this is a D7 chord, or sorry, an A7 chord over C sharp of 2. However, I think what we're getting ready for is a cadence, a perfect authentic cadence, even in the key of A minor. So what I think this uh, A7 chord is preparing us for is a modulation to... A minor. So we'll call this 2 here, but if we consider this also a modulation to A minor, we're going to call this 4. And interestingly enough, we have a suspension that doesn't resolve within the chord. Like the chord changes before we get this G going down to any type of F natural. Instead, we continue to, with the F sharp, uh, the F sharp and the alto here, where we get D sharp, B, F sharp, B. Uh, that's a, a D major, or sorry, a B major triad over D sharp. So that would be a five, six of five. B is the dominant of E, which is the five of A minor. And we would expect this to go to five. E, B, E, G sharp. That is a five chord. Uh, e major being the dominant of A minor. And then we get to A minor. So this is sort of like what I mean by this uh, playfulness between modality and tonality. Uh, Dorian is just one half step away from being melodic minor and vice versa melodic minor is just one half step away from being dorian so we see that there is like flirtation with the idea of both because the melodies that bach is harmonizing in his chorales are all uh, or i would say that the majority of them that we've looked at so far with my research have predated tonality therefore his harmonizations of them are going to be tonal reconciliations of what was composed in a modal period. Now, because most modal, the like the, these these melodies for church, they had like a narrow ambitus. You could contextualize them in a number of ways, and usually the modality didn't um, appear just in the melody by itself. It, just the fragments that Bach were, was using, um, or maybe Bach would um, you know change up a note here or there to fit his harmonic agenda. But in this case. Um, we see that there are F sharps in uh, F sharps being used to honor that Renaissance tradition. I would say uh, we do get F sharps. Um, I don't think we get any F sharps in the melody because the range of the melody is so narrow. We have A pretty much up to D. It's just the range of a fourth. That's like the the extent of the melody. So really, you can treat that however you want. Um, because there's only a fourth there. It can be contextualized in a variety of different ways. A minor, a Dorian, um, just different flavors of these mi this minor sound or modes that have a minor feel to them. We immediately afterwards go to... See, we don't have D major here. We have D minor in first inversion, which is F, A, D, A. And that immediately goes to uh, G. It immediately goes to a G chord with an F carried over. So this would be like a 7-7 seven, seven, or a 7-4-2. Um, actually, it goes to, I'm going to erase that there. 
because 4 does want to go to 7, but a substitute for 7 is 5 of 3, and this is 5, 4, 2 of 3, and that goes immediately to 3, 6, which is exactly how you would expect it to, to go. So we have like a tonicization of the relative major here, C major, and then we have F sharp again, F sharp, A, D, A. So here is where the analysis starts to get tricky. You don't really see a lot of tonicization of 7 because 7 is a relatively weak sound in a minor key until you introduce the leading tone. And D major uh, would be the dominant of G major, um, but the 7 in a minor key would, would typically be G sharp, as you sort of see here. That's what gives the pull. That's what creates the function in the harmony, is that everything is sort of either um, moving towards the dominant Move more, moving towards the tonic, so there's um, kind of like a give and take going on. Um, but here, I guess we have it. We have a five, six of seven, and then we have seven, and then we have F sharp, B, D, B. Uh, we could analyze these as um, we could analyze this as five, six, four of five. Um, I'm gonna put that in parentheses though because it does not go where we expect it to. It goes to G sharp D F B, which is seven fully diminished in this case, which goes to one. So I feel like this right here, this seven chord, all this seven chord is is a half step away from being our five because seven is really just a substitute for five, right? They function the same way. They're a third apart, so they share two tones, and the note that they don't have in common is a seventh apart or a second apart, depending on how you look at it. E, G sharp, B versus G sharp, B, D. So this is sort of like a, almost like a 5-9 chord, like with the flat 9, the F being the, or, um, sorry, there is no flat 9 in here, there's no B flat, it's a B natural, it's like a 5-9 chord almost. And that goes to 1 like you would expect it to. And then we get D, D, F, C, that is a 4, sorry for the ambulance in the background, 4-7 right there which is interesting because we get the seventh as like this held tone, like there's like a syncopation between the tenor and the soprano going on in this measure in anticipation for the cadence. Then we have E, D, G, B, which is interesting because we get, in this case, a five chord in minor. We get like a minor five that happens, and it's even a minor five seven. But I really do think this is more so a byproduct of counterpoint than anything else. So and this also comments on like the modality of the piece, that it's not purely tonal. It definitely has modal elements, as we see F sharps used throughout without acknowledging the G sharp. But we also see instances of melodic minor, like in, in anticipation for the cadence, which is very um, a very Renaissance stylistic thing to do. So 4, 7, 5, 7. And that's going to go to F, C, G, A. I think this is another one of these sort of like second uh, suspensions that doesn't get resolved. So this is six right here, an F major triad, which turns into D sharp, F sharp, A, C. That's seven fully diminished in root position of five because D sharp is the leading tone to E, which is our dominant. And then that goes to E major. And then we cadence on A major because we have the C sharp in the tenor, A, C sharp, E, A. A perfect, authentic cadence. Really interesting chorale. Um, it was short, which was nice, obviously, after having to analyze that like behemoth <laughs> yesterday. If you haven't watched that video, check it out. Um, yeah, this one is uh, interesting because it's very clearly not purely tonal. Um, it's definitely has, has modal influence, but it's not, I wouldn't classify it as modal either. It's not one or the other. It's sort of like a reconciliation of both. I use the term reconciliation because Bach is dealing with older material and he's trying to adapt it to his newer style or the harmonic conventions of his present, the, what, what his contemporaneous composers are doing. That being said, uh, this fascinating chorale, very cool. 
It was interesting to look at. Let me know if there is anything that you found different in your own analysis or if there's anything you caught in what I said that might not have agreed with what you believed in. I'm interested in starting some conversations with those of you who are watching the videos. Um, and I am looking forward to tomorrow's analysis. Thanks for watching, everyone. Happy New Year and take care.